Coming up on Market to Market, Congress examines connections between agriculture and the weather. The nation's ethanol leader proposes a sales mandate that could hammer retailers. But again, and Market Analysis with uh, Sue Martin, next. No, they're not totally up to speed either in wheat production. What's the most complex industry on Earth? It's not genetics, or meteorology, or logistics. It's a business that involves them all. It's farming. Thank you, farmers, from Pioneer. Tomorrow, for over 100 years, we've worked to help our customers be ready for tomorrow. Trust in tomorrow. Information is available from a Grinnell Mutual agent today. This is the Friday, February 26th edition of Market to Market, the weekly journal of rural America. Hello, I'm Paul Yeager. If confidence is more about actions than feelings, the government reports used as a barometer are speaking volumes right now. New home sales blew past expectations with a 4.3% jump. Lumber prices are up 130% over last year. The measuring stick for long-lasting items extended its winning streak to nine months. A surge in orders for civilian aircraft led the report. When the volatile transportation sector is removed, the core rate improved 1.4 percent. The Biden administration has made clear their intentions to center their studying efforts on climate. Two more C words, Congress and carbon, came together this week as hearings on the topic began. Josh Bittner reports. If not the yeas are 92, the nays are 7, and the nominee is confirmed. Following strong bipartisan Senate confirmation, this week the Biden administration welcomed former USDA chief Tom Vilsack back to the role he held throughout former President Barack Obama's tenure. So help me God. Congratulations, Mr. Secretary. On the heels of Vilsack swearing in, the House Agricultural Committee took the reins on one priority for the new administration. Speaking with members of the weather, agriculture, and environmental sectors about utilizing farm, forestry, and conservation techniques to combat climate change. This is perhaps the single most important hearing that we must have right now. As a farmer and rancher, I have been affected by the extreme variability in weather. Drought, flooding, extreme cold and heat. The change in our climate is affecting everyone and every farm. Agriculture is often vilified as being a major contributor to climate change. But you can help agriculture become a major part of the solution. 30 to 40 percent of all the food produced is never used. And this means that the fuel, water, and fertilizer that's used to produce it is wasted. And more greenhouse gases are produced as that food waste is dumped into landfills and tractors and water pumps are run for no good reason. Total carbon sink efforts uh, from forest land, grassland management, uh, and management of cropland offset approximately 12% of the total U.S. emissions. To continue to make these gains in carbon sequestration, we need to increase investment in agricultural research. I think we are at a why not moment with reference to the climate change. Testifying before lawmakers weeks prior, Vilsack championed the notion of new markets to incentivize soil health and build biomanufacturing rural economies. While the agricultural field welcomes those new opportunities, committee members shared concerns that opportunistic carbon markets could squeeze out smaller producers. I think a number of experts indicate that that could be a real concern with something like a carbon bank. Prodded by Republicans, farm advocates said the additional revenue streams remain largely undiscovered and possible climate-related taxes and regulations could spur an exodus of support for USDA's endeavor. For Market to Market, I'm Josh Bittner. Iowa accounts for 25 percent of the nation's ethanol production. A plan by the state's governor is looking to expand market share, but it could come at a cost to those on the front lines of fuel distribution. Peter Tubbs reports. 
this location, it would require a total upgrade as far as tanks, lines, and dispensers. So I'm looking at putting in, uh, actually I'm going to upgrade it in the spring. So a little over $450,000. So it's about a, you know, right at a half a million dollars to do the upgrade here. And I'll be putting in three gas dispensers and one diesel here. Dan Moller's owns gas stations in 10 Iowa towns and is looking at an expensive upgrade path at his stations in Newton, Iowa. Each pump currently dispenses both gasoline with ethanol and gasoline without ethanol and are being upgraded with new infrastructure that would accommodate E15, gasoline blended with up to 15% ethanol. But a bill working its way through the Iowa legislature would require almost all of the gasoline pumps in the state of Iowa to be E15 compliant by 2026, changing the plans of this station and requiring hard choices for fuel retailers across the state. The biofuels industry believes the upgrade costs will be justified by increased sales volumes of renewable fuels. So it's going to be great for the farmers, it's going to be great for biofuels producers, but it's going to be great for consumers. Right now, only 250 out of 2,400 stations give you the option of E15, which is higher octane for your car, but lower cost for your wallet. Why wouldn't we want every Iowan to be able to go to a gas station and find E15? The Iowa bill includes $7 million in grants each year that will pay up to 70% of the cost to upgrade infrastructure at retailers an increase from the current $3 million per year. A study commissioned by the Iowa Renewable Fuels Association estimates that converting almost all of the 13,000 gasoline pumps in the state to E15 will sell an additional $50 million of wholesale ethanol per year, increasing production a little less than 1% annually. Fuel retailers believe the cost of the upgrade could run as high as a billion dollars statewide. There's been a lot of numbers thrown out that are just, quite frankly, hogwash. If a retailer wants to move to E15, they may choose to replace a lot of equipment. But let's not confuse that with what they would be required to replace. In Iowa, the fire marshal took UL guidance, Underwriters Laboratory guidance, and approved all of our dispensers to dispense E15. You do not have to replace a dispenser to dispense E15. I'm not sure where they're getting their information from because I flat out, you know, this site, you're, you're close to a half a million dollars because the tanks aren't compatible, the piping, the dispensers are not. It's definitely, you know, that billion dollar number that's been put out there. The bill up for consideration in the Iowa House would limit the availability of gasoline without ethanol to a single pump per location, which may encourage station owners to stop selling the product at some locations rather than devote an underground tank to a single pump. The large estimates of upgrade costs may result in stores that sell low volumes of gasoline to pull out their pumps or to close altogether. A proposed change to the Iowa tax credit structure currently utilized by gasoline retailers only provides credit for biofuel sales above a new benchmark that could free up tax dollars for more infrastructure grants. Federal and state grants will help finance upgrades at this station and another in Newton that sits next to Interstate 80, but grant dollars may fall short of the price needed for a rapid statewide upgrade. If the bill becomes law, the mandate would increase at diesel pumps to B20, a blend of 80% diesel fuel and 20% soy diesel for most of the year. The move would result in a production increase of roughly 10% over five years. Retailers have been shifting to E15 slowly, mostly as new stations have been built across the state. Most are aware that gasoline sales peaked in 2007 nationally and were flat in the five years before the COVID-19 pandemic reduced consumer driving habits. Based on costs and the new normal in usage, most retailers would prefer a slower transition that meets market demands. And the E10, you know, it's 87% of what we sell today is an ethanol blended product. So, I mean, it's working. People buy that, it's less expensive, and it worked well in their vehicles. For Market to Market, I'm Peter Tubbs. Next, the Market to Market Report. Export sales reports took the wind out of many markets this week as lower totals sent some long contract holders for the exits. For the week, May wheat gained a nickel, while the nearby corn contract added six cents. Another large outbreak of African swine fever in China is likely going to curtail the demand for U.S. soybeans. Nearby beans improved 24 cents. May soybean meal dropped 2.20 per ton. 
May cotton shrank by $1.65 per hundredweight. In the dairy parlor, March Class 3 milk futures declined 5 cents. A mixed week in the livestock sector. April cattle fell 368. April feeders dropped a dime, and the April lean hog contract added 265. In the currency markets, the U.S. dollar index gained 46 ticks. April crude oil increased 262 per barrel. COMEX gold weakened 50.90 per ounce. And the Goldman Sachs Commodity Index added more than nine points to finish at 477.85. Here now to provide insights, one of our regular market analysts, Sue Martin. Hello, Sue. Hello there. All right, so exports is what I started to try to say smoothly, but, you know, sometimes it doesn't always go that way. The export sales, we've become accustomed to a certain level of exports here in the last couple of months. I want to start with a question that came. We got a lot of great questions via Facebook and Twitter, and this one came from James in Oklahoma, and it's a little bit about stocks and the exports. He says, with large U.S. and world wheat stocks, what's the justification for these prices? Is it exports? Is it something else? I think it's uh, one, global supplies. You might think that stocks are burdensome in wheat, but they're not. They're in decline. And U.S. stocks are tightening as well. And then you have corn that's interchangeable with wheat, and our stocks are tightening considerably there. And so the only uh, domino left to fall in that category would be uh, rice. And rice stocks are aggressive in the world at this time. So wheat is moving along because it's a food item. China has uh, imported wheat. They took, uh, you know, in January, uh, they took, uh, or December, I should say, they took pretty much most of the Chicago wheat deliveries, which is unusual. And uh, I think that when we look at the wheat market, here's a market that's gone through. It's like a cat with nine lives. You keep trying to kill it, but it doesn't seem to die. But there's the uncertainty of knowing just how the U.S. crop has fared through this bitterly Siberian polar vortex that we went through. And then that's on top of Russia being very concerned about their supplies and domestic food inflation prices rising to where they've added on export tax. And on March 1st, another one goes into effect. And so and then you've got Ukraine, who is also became very protectionistic of their supplies. So I think it's a fundamentally demand driven market. You mentioned the weather. Uh we're going to get a good sense next week because if you looked at the snowpack picture from the beginning of the week to the end of the week, it just disappeared in two days in the wheat belt. Is it one of those lives we will find out if we spent in the wheat market next week, or do you think we already know and the market's already factored it in? No, I think the market's still in quandary as to what really is out there and the condition of the crop. And they're waiting. You know, this past week, the crop condition ratings that we got were a little, you know, they were optimistic, I guess, and traders were disappointed. But that also, we had to realize that was a very early crop condition rating, and those are going to change appreciably as we go forward. So I think that when we look at the wheat, March is a month that you start breaking dormancy, and you know, and then you have a seasonality in corn where prices tend to decline. So you kind of got the two playing together, and I think that's part of, we've had a lot of velocity in the wheat market here. And $7, you get close to it, and it seems like that's a magical number. So we're falling back, and the market's kind of just saying, I need to rest for a minute. Magic numbers are floating around in corn and in soybeans. Let's start with corn first. Uh, there was one question that we had that somebody was asking, you know, when are we going to put a five in front? I mean, we had a five. When are we going to put six or seven? Are those magical numbers out of reach in corn? No, no, they're not. Um, I think, you know, we've talked about the gaps that are on these individual contract months, you know, July corn, SEP corn, December corn. And they go, there's various combinations, and they go all the way up to 709. So I do think we get them. Do we get them all this year? Probably not, but we get a chunk of it. And then we'll catch a pullback. Um, I don't, you know, July corn, for example, made new contract highs here in the month of February. Normally, very rarely would you put a February high in and that be, especially after a post-harvest rally, and that be your top for the year. It's, I think you've got better coming yet, and I would have to say we might see a healthy correction first. 
because you have said in the past, I think maybe just in the last couple of weeks, you've written that when we perform well in February, that bodes well down the road. Yes, it does. It um, has a very strong tendency when you take out those post-harvest rallies, uh, highs that, in other words, that's from November through January. In February, and it's a new contract high, then you tend to come back and make higher highs again. And I, this year is following, the, uh, this is a question, you know, that probably is going to come up, but we are following the path of 2008 pretty closely. Okay, and somebody wanted to know, are we? Yes, yeah. yes we are, and in beans as well. However, it is just not 2008 that we're following. I have, even in beans, two studies where um, one's on May and one's on the July contract, and we've set those up. It took us right almost to the end of the month to get it done, but they're set up as well. And the key here is, is that we're in a demand pulled market. And the, I went back and I looked at the year of 2008, but there's other years that are very similar as well. But uh, in 2008, I thought it was rather interesting. Uh, it started off with a client asking me, you know, could you go back and look at 2012 and see if your cycles were the same then? So I went back and no, they were clicking every month, just like clockwork. And uh, so then I thought, I'm going to go look at 2008 because China was a huge buyer of commodities that into that year. They were awarded in 2003 the Beijing Summer Olympics. And when that happened, they needed everything. We were just talking about that last week uh, after the show with Elaine. We were discussing yes. the Olympics. So with soybeans, though, th there's a question that's floating out. Have they left the party right now in buying? A have they taken a pause do you think they're coming back going using your 8 and 12 references that you were just marking? Well, I think that um, um, we made the new contract highs, so I, I think there's very good uh, potential that we will come back and make higher highs again for the year. I don't think our highs are in, period, for the year, uh, straight across, especially corn and soybeans. And, but I do think we are going to have a pause. One of the things that feeds that thought, not just because it happened in 2008, but you've got, there's several things. One is my cyclical work that I do. Ironically, that year is identical to this year. Maybe a few days off in time, mm -hmm. but, but pretty close. And we broke that year. Um, the other thing, and before we renewed the last hurrah rally and Chinese buying then, you know, culminated, well, this year we've got phase one culminating. Uh, but the other thing is, is that you look at South America and you look at Brazil and very late in getting their crop in is part of the reason they're late getting it out. And then the rains that kept coming across the north. Uh, now we're seeing the European model waffle a bit and kind of show that they might start to dry out in the north and a ridge set up. And if that occurs, that'll push rains to the south and then on into Argentina, which they badly need. That kind of gave us a chatter. So we do have a weather market going. But in the meantime, the concern of tight supplies, U.S. supplies, how tight we are. And then you look at the draw that, you know, the farmer in Brazil sold so far ahead early. And then all of a sudden he had to stop because he wasn't sure how his crop was going right. to be. And now the quality issue is coming into play because we don't know what that true quality is on those beans with the rains that have been coming. Uh, that could impact some oil content. And then the other thing that we're looking at, of course, like with China, with the ASF, uh, concerns there that they might slow, but their crushing margins aren't as great right now either. But more than anything, it's our stocks, how tight they are, tight supplied. And the, the COVID did pull into... Um, the demand side for veg oils. Everybody's cooking at home, right. you know, we're just, we're not using used oil and reusing it like in a restaurant sometimes. It's, everybody's cooking big, at home. Big demand. Okay, so soil was a story for the soybeans, uh, but also I want to flip into the hog market just a little bit because there is the report of the emergence again of African swine fever in China. Uh, hogs were the one of the, the livestock winner this week. Is it because of China that were um, up in hogs, but yet down in soybeans a little bit because of a less demand for feed. Where's that? Because we had that debate about yeah. a year ago, um, two years ago. I think more than anything, the market's had a huge run and it's kind of tired. You know, it's taken us a whole month to get the higher highs in beans. Okay, 
now you look at hogs, and I've been bullish hogs for some time, and it's starting to be more towards fruition. It's not done yet. Um, I believe that you're going to take June hogs to 100. And, you know, that's kind of a magical. We've been there before. The all-time high is 133-something. Um, but I think that when I look at the hog market, uh, pork is probably a cheaper product of meat. You have uh, PERS going on in the U.S. and PED virus following up on a year when you had uh, liquidation uh, because of just horribly cheap prices and, and packers not able to process all the animals and what have you. And then you look at uh, over in China, and they're in the process of getting themselves back up to speed. They said by June they would be back to where they were to begin with before ASF hit them. That's fine. They're moving more into a more westernized, commercial-oriented, more efficient uh, situation, production situation. And when I look at China, do I see them stopping at that le level where they once were? No, I think right. they're going to surpass it because food is so critical right now and they want supplies and they need to replenish their supplies. Let's move into the cattle market because inflation is a concern a little bit on the consumer that's going to buy on the live cattle uh, market. Is that a weight, do you think, on live cattle? Well, the cattle market is, ironically, go back to the year of 2008 again, and here again, cattle were doing the same thing then that they're doing now. Um, don't know for sure just totally why, but I will say this, um, when I look at the cattle market, first off, the recent really bad cold snap, the black swan event that happened all the way down to the Gulf, there's a lot of utility bills that are gonna have to be paid, and that's gonna, in the old days, and I think it'll again, it's gonna interfere with the grocery bill. And that's beef that's probably going to take a back seat to other things. You have an earlier Easter this year, and so that's on April 4th. Um, so I think that's weighing on the beef market a little bit right now, too. So, and then today, on Friday, you had um, the um, expiration on the February contract, and it went off the board at 113.90 on its face. Uh, that's a little disappointing. I don't trust cattle. I don't think they're done. There is a major trend line of support about, uh, I want to say around maybe uh, a dollar lower than where we closed on Friday, but I don't trust this market very well. <laughs> okay. Uh, what about on the feeder market uh, in 30 seconds? Um, they're also weighted with some of those same factors, but the feed issue is still a problem. Well, the feed issue is a problem, and I hear this often, that it's kind of like well, back in my day when I started, it didn't matter what feed costs were. That didn't mean prices had to go up. Unfortunately, I do think that um, feed costs are really going to irritate uh, the cattle feeder producer uh, for some time, at, at, well, in, at least into June, July. Then we'll get some relief, and they better use it to lock up all the way in through 2023 if they can. We'll talk signals on what to look for in Market Plus. Thank okay. you so very much, Sue. Good to see you. Thank you. All right, that will do it for the installment of the TV show we call Market to Market. We will keep it going in Market Plus, so join us there. Find that on our website of markettomarket.org. Now, during the next few weeks, we're headed into an important part of public television, pledge time. Many of the stations that carry this program may shift when we are on, but the message is clear. If you value the work done on this program, please consider supporting the work that we do with a financial contribution to your local PBS station. Next week, we check out the report card for the Mississippi River. Until then, thanks for watching and have a great week. Market to Market is a production of Iowa PBS, which is solely responsible for its content. What's the most complex industry on Earth? It's not genetics, or meteorology, or logistics. It's a business that involves them all. It's farming. Thank you, farmers, from Pioneer. Tomorrow, for over 100 years, we've worked to help our customers be ready for tomorrow. Trust in tomorrow. Information is available from a Grinnell Mutual agent today.